Welcome to our animated book summary of The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. If you've ever been held back by procrastination, fear, or self-sabotage, this is the video for you. We delve into the hidden forces of resistance that obstruct your artistic and professional progress and share actionable strategies to conquer them. You'll learn how to shift from an amateur mindset to a professional one, embrace your inner foolishness for greater creativity, and tap into the depths of your unconscious mind for unparalleled inspiration. Perfect for entrepreneurs, writers, artists, musicians, or anyone with a creative spark, this video is set to ignite your passion and equip you with the tools to overcome any obstacle in your creative journey. Get ready to unlock your true potential and revolutionize your approach to your work and passions. Let's get started. Before we dive into the first idea, if you are a visual learner, you have to check our app, Morphosis. We have animated book summary videos for the best self-development and business books. Click the link in the description to get a seven-day free trial and learn from hundreds of animated book summaries. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so you get notified when we upload free videos. Idea 1. Resistance. Resistance, as explored in The War of Art, is a powerful force that works against human creativity and achievement. It's like an invisible enemy that constantly tries to stop us from doing our important work. Imagine it as a wall or barrier that shows up every time we want to create something, start a new project, or make a positive change in our lives. This force is tricky because it's not easy to see or touch. It hides in different forms, procrastination, self-doubt, fear, and even distractions like spending too much time on social media or watching TV. It's what makes us say, I'll do it tomorrow, when we know we should be doing it today. What's really interesting is that resistance often hits hardest when we're trying to do something that truly matters to us. Whether it's writing a book, starting a business, or pursuing a personal dream, the closer the project is to our heart, the stronger resistance can feel. It's like it knows where we're most vulnerable and attacks right there. Resistance also plays mind games. It can make us feel not good enough or scare us with thoughts of failure. It can even trick us into thinking we're working hard by keeping us busy with things that don't really matter. The book makes it clear that everyone faces this battle with resistance and it's a normal part of the creative process. The key to beating resistance is to recognize it for what it is, an internal enemy. By knowing it's there and understanding its tricks, we can start to fight back. It's not about completely getting rid of resistance. It's more about learning how to push through it and keep moving forward with our work day by day. So, the struggle against resistance is not just about making art or finishing a project. It's a daily fight to live the life we truly want and to be the person we really want to be. It's about not letting this invisible force hold us back from our true potential. Idea 2. Professionalism versus Amateurism In the world of creativity and work, there are two types of mindsets, that of a professional and that of an amateur. Understanding the difference between these two can be a game-changer in how we approach our goals and passions. An amateur loves what they do, but their approach can be casual or inconsistent. They might work on their craft only when they feel inspired or when it's convenient, this approach often means they struggle to finish projects or make significant progress. They might blame outside factors for their lack of progress and might not push through the tough times. On the other hand, a professional takes their work seriously. They show up every day, no matter what, and put in the time and effort, even when they don't feel like it. For a professional, their craft or work isn't just a hobby or a pastime. It's a central part of their life. They commit to their work over the long haul, not just for a week or a month. A professional also understands that facing challenges and overcoming them is part of the process. They don't get easily discouraged by setbacks or negative feedback. Instead, they learn from these experiences and use them to grow. They know that mastery of their craft requires patience, practice and persistence. Another key aspect is how professionals handle fear and self-doubt. 
While amateurs might let these feelings stop them, professionals work through them. They don't wait for perfect conditions or for fear to vanish. They move forward despite their fears, understanding that fear never really goes away, especially when doing something important or meaningful. Professionals also don't rely solely on inspiration. They have systems and routines that help them stay productive, even on days when inspiration is low. They treat their work with respect and give it the time and attention it deserves, treating it as a significant part of their life, not just something they do on the side. So, the difference between being a professional and an amateur isn't about skill level or success. It's about mindset and approach. It's about how seriously one takes their work and how committed they are to seeing it through, no matter what obstacles they face. If you like the video so far, give it a like and subscribe to our channel so you get notified when we upload more animated book summaries. Also, leave a comment if you agree or disagree with the ideas of this book. We read all your comments. Thank you for your support. Now let's continue. Idea 3. The Role of the Muse The idea of the muse is a fascinating one, especially when it comes to creative work. It's about where inspiration comes from and how it influences us. The muse is like a guiding force or a source of creative energy that can help bring ideas to life. It's an ancient concept, often thought of as a kind of magical or divine presence that whispers ideas into the artist's ear. But in a more practical sense, the muse represents something deep inside us, or maybe something that exists in a realm beyond our normal understanding. It's not something that you can command or control. Instead, it's something you invite into your work. The relationship with the muse is more about being open and receptive to inspiration when it comes. Engaging with the muse requires a certain level of commitment and respect for the creative process. It's about showing up regularly for your work, being present, and ready to receive whatever inspiration the muse might offer. This doesn't mean just sitting around waiting for a magical moment. It involves hard work, patience, and often facing a lot of resistance. The muse is also unpredictable. Sometimes inspiration strikes out of the blue in moments or ways we least expect. Other times, it can feel like the muse is absent, no matter how hard we try to find it. This unpredictability can be frustrating, but it's also part of what makes the creative process so exciting and rewarding. It's also important to recognize that everyone has their own muse or source of inspiration. What inspires one person might not work for someone else. This personal connection to the muse is what gives each piece of art or creative work its unique flavor and personality. Nurturing a relationship with the muse is an integral part of the creative journey. It's about being open to new ideas, willing to experiment, and not being afraid to fail. It's also about trusting in the process and believing that the muse will be there when you need it, guiding and inspiring your work in ways you might not even expect. Idea 4. Territorial versus Hierarchical Orientation Territorial versus hierarchical orientation is an interesting concept, especially when looking at how people approach their work and creativity. In a nutshell, it's about whether you're driven by external recognition or by the satisfaction of the work itself. A hierarchical orientation is when someone's motivation comes from where they stand in relation to others. It's like being in a race, always checking to see who's ahead and who's behind. In this mindset, success is measured by external factors like status, rank, or the approval of others. It's about climbing ladders and being acknowledged by peers or society. The downside of this approach is that it can make you dependent on external validation. Your happiness and sense of worth might fluctuate based on how others see you or on things you can't control. On the other hand, a territorial orientation is when you find satisfaction in the work itself. It's like having your own playground or domain where you feel at home. Here, the joy comes from the process of doing the work, not from how it's received or perceived by others. This approach lets you be more authentic and true to yourself because you're not chasing external approval. You're focused on what you love to do and that in itself is fulfilling. 
people with a territorial orientation are often more resilient to criticism and rejection. Since their satisfaction doesn't hinge on external validation, they can keep going even when the outside world doesn't applaud them. They're also more likely to take risks and be innovative, as they're not bound by the rules and judgments of a hierarchy. This concept doesn't mean that one way is better than the other. Instead, it's about understanding what drives you and how that influences your work and happiness. Some people might find themselves somewhere in between, getting motivation from both their position in the hierarchy and the love of their work. Recognizing whether you lean more towards a territorial or hierarchical orientation can help you make choices that align more closely with your true nature and what brings you fulfillment. Idea 5. Love and Dedication to Work Love and dedication to work are crucial for anyone pursuing a creative path or any meaningful project. It's about more than just liking what you do. It involves a deep, enduring commitment to your work, a kind of devotion that goes beyond occasional enthusiasm or sporadic effort. When you love your work deeply, it becomes a part of who you are. It's not just a task to be completed, but a vital expression of yourself and your talents. This kind of love for what you do can fuel you through tough times, when things aren't going well or when you face obstacles. It keeps you anchored during periods of doubt and uncertainty. Dedication is the practical side of this love. It means showing up to do the work, even when you don't feel like it. It's about discipline, not in a harsh, restrictive sense, but as a way to honor your commitment to your craft. When you're dedicated, you give your work the time and attention it deserves. You treat it with respect, like you would a valued relationship. This kind of dedication doesn't mean forcing yourself through endless hours of joyless work. It's more about maintaining a steady, consistent effort, even when it's hard or when the inspiration isn't flowing freely. It's understanding that not every day will be exciting or successful, but each day's effort is a step towards achieving your goals. When you combine love and dedication in your work, you create a powerful force. This combination helps you to overcome the internal barriers and resistance that everyone faces. It also allows you to keep growing and improving, to learn from your mistakes and failures, and to find joy in the process, not just the end results. Loving and dedicating yourself to your work also means taking care of yourself. It's recognizing that your physical, emotional, and mental well-being are all essential to your creative output. This holistic approach ensures that you're not just productive, but also satisfied and happy with what you do. In essence, love and dedication to work are about forming a deep, meaningful connection with what you do and committing to it fully. It's about seeing your work as a vital part of your life's journey not just a way to achieve external success or recognition. Idea 6. Fear as an indicator. Fear as an indicator is a unique way of looking at our fears, especially when it comes to creative work or pursuing our goals. Usually, we see fear as a signal to stop, a warning that something bad might happen. But in the context of personal and creative growth, fear can actually be a sign that we're on the right track. Think of fear as a compass, pointing you towards things that really matter to you. Often, the more afraid we are of attempting something, the more it means to us. This could be writing a book, starting a business, or even changing a career. The intensity of the fear often matches how much we care about the outcome. This idea flips the script on how we usually deal with fear. Instead of running away from it, we can learn to understand and embrace it as a guide. It doesn't mean that the things we fear are necessarily dangerous or impossible. Instead, it means these are areas where there's a lot at stake for us personally, where there's a lot of room for growth and self-expression. Approaching fear in this way requires a change in mindset. It's about recognizing that feeling scared doesn't mean you're weak or unprepared. It means you're facing something that has the potential to be transformative. It's a sign that you're pushing your boundaries, exploring new territories, 
and challenging yourself to go beyond your comfort zone. However, embracing fear as an indicator doesn't make it any less challenging to face. It still requires courage and a willingness to confront what scares you. It's about acknowledging the fear, understanding its source, and then taking steps forward despite it. The idea isn't to eliminate fear, but to learn to move forward alongside it. Seeing fear as an indicator also helps in prioritizing your efforts. In a world where there are endless paths we could take, our fears can help point us toward the paths that are truly meaningful for us. It's a way of tuning in to our deepest desires and motivations, even if they're masked by apprehension and doubt. So, in a sense, fear becomes a tool, a way to identify the pursuits that hold the most potential for personal fulfillment and growth. It's not about seeking fear for fear's sake, but about recognizing that when we're scared of something that aligns with our goals and values, it's often a sign that we're heading in the right direction. Idea 7. The Artist's Journey The Artist's Journey is a concept that describes the unique path each artist or creative individual takes in their life and work. It's a personal, often challenging, but ultimately rewarding process of self-discovery and creative expression. This journey is not just about the final artwork or product, but about the entire experience of creating, learning and growing. At its core, this journey is deeply individual. No two artists have the same path. Each person's journey is shaped by their own experiences, struggles and insights. It's a path filled with ups and downs, successes and setbacks. It involves facing fears, overcoming doubts and dealing with resistance, both from within and from the outside world. On this journey, the artist learns not just about their craft, but also about themselves. It's a process of self-discovery, where each project or piece of work reveals a little more about the artist's inner world, their values and their view of life. This journey often leads to personal transformation, as the act of creating changes the creator. The journey also involves a continuous process of learning and mastering one's craft. It's not just about innate talent, but about the dedication to refine and develop one's skills. This requires patience, practice, and persistence, as true mastery takes time. An important aspect of the artist's journey is the relationship with the audience. Sharing one's work with others can be daunting, but it's also an essential part of the journey. It's a way of communicating, of touching the lives of others, and of contributing something unique and valuable to the world. The journey is also marked by periods of solitude and introspection necessary for any creative process. It's in these quiet moments that many breakthroughs and insights occur. Solitude provides the space for the artist to connect deeply with their work, free from distractions and external influences. Throughout the journey, the artist must also learn to balance their inner vision with the practical aspects of life and work. This includes dealing with practical challenges like making a living, managing time, and navigating the business side of art. The artist's journey is, in many ways, a lifelong commitment. It doesn't end with the completion of a project or the achievement of a certain level of fame. It's a continuous, evolving process of creation and expression, driven by a deep love for one's art and a desire to share that love with the world. These were only some of the ideas of our animated book summary. If you want to see the full animated book summary, just download our app from the description below. It has hundreds of videos like this one, and you can watch it with the seven-day free trial offer we have. Just click the button in the description and start learning today. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so you get notified when we upload free videos.